I have the privilege of giving the talk on advancements in shoulder arthroscopy for large to irreparable rotator cuff tears. My name is Sharif Bechet. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. When we talk about rotator cuff disease, we realize that this is a huge population of patients with roughly four to six million people per year that seek some sort of medical attention for this type of injury. 1.5 will find their way to an orthopedic surgeon, so not just to the sports or shoulder elbow surgeons, but also to the general orthopedist. So it's very important to realize the different options and understand the different ways we can treat these patients. It's first important to understand the anatomy of the rotator cuff with the different layers, with layer one being superficial fibers that overlie the cuff and extend to the coracohumeral ligament, layers two and three, which are the fibers of the rotator cuff, and then even deeper to the deep extension of the coracohumeral ligament, then layer five, which over the last few years has become very popular as this is the superior capsule. It's seen here in this diagram on the right. In this particular video, you can see that this delaminated rotator cuff shows layers one through four, very thin here, and layer five being the superior capsule underneath are delaminated. It's very, you have to be very careful to realize that that is a rotator cuff on the top and not necessarily a bursa. Bursa has already been removed. It's also important to note that the superior capsule is medially attached to the tuberosity along the articular margin. If you try to bring this over too lateral, you can over tension this rotator cuff repair and in the end probably end up with a type two failure at the myotendinous junction. So when we look at the different type tears, there's partial thickness tears, the pasta lesions, the paint lesions, and the full thickness tear, uh, which is usually classified by size. We're gonna discuss the large, massive, and irreparable tears today. It's important to understand the tuberosity and how to define where that cuff is gonna to return to. So in this Alan Curtis article from 2006 from arthroscopy, the color coding is excellent as it shows you where the supraspinatus will come and sit, where the infraspinatus teres minor and subscapularis. It's also important to note the variance uh, that sometimes this red area where the infraspinatus attaches will actually attach posterior and lateral to the uh, supraspinatus. So it's very important to understand the different variations. And then finally, to see the direction that supraspinatus needs the seat. So it's gonna be more anterior and lateral and not just straight lateral. So it's important to view from the lateral side in order to appropriately position this rotator cuff for repair. So when we're looking at massive tears, there's a menu. Are we gonna try conservative treatment, debride and tenotomy and rehab, maybe a partial repair, maybe a repair with some sort of matrix, whether it be an augment or a scaffold or a biologic, some sort of bridging interposition, uh, superior capsule reconstruction, subacromial spacer, and then transfers. Is there a way we can predict to see if our rotator cuff will heal? Well, in this article uh, by Christian Gerber's group, 33 patients uh, with an MRI at two years. And what they found if, is uh, patients with Catalier grade two and three with a tendon of less than 15 millimeters did poorly, upwards of 92% failure rate. But if there's tendon length of greater than 15 millimeters and no fatty infiltration, there's only a less than 25% failure rate. And it's important to understand Catalier uh, as when you look at something like this, you can see this is probably greater than 50% for the supraspinatus. So it's much like uh, if you do eat red meat, this here, you would want to eat this one on the left and not the one on the right. So when you look at that much fatty infiltration, that you know that that's not a healthy piece of meat. So same when we look at Coutelier's uh, particular classification. So here you can see when you have more fat than muscle, that's a problem and, and likely this will not heal. Uh, Peter Chalmers and his group made an app, and here's the address to it if you'd like to add it to your, uh, your iPhone or iPad. Uh, and so what they did is they looked at these different articles utilizing over 2,500 patients, and this algorithm takes these variables, and if you place them into this uh, calculator, it'll give you a percentage of failure. Uh, what's interesting about this is many of these variables we can really understand before surgery and have a good idea, and almost like a crystal ball, to see if these will heal ahead of time. Does age matter? In this article uh, by Tajian, 49 patients, arthroscopy, double row repair. When looking at these, they found that the age at the time of surgery, an average was 59, but when they were 55 for the younger or 63 for the older, the younger were more likely to heal. Uh, looking at all these different outcomes with BAS and active forward flexion, ASES, and simple shoulder score, it was found that age at the time of surgery and the number of years that postoperative follow correlated with the best cuff healing. Again, looking at this, 
uh, 120 patients, looking at the uh, failure rates, about two thirds healed and one third failed. Incidence of re-tear increased with age greater than 60, size of initial tear, as well as increased fatty degeneration. So again, many of these things we can see ahead of time and really have a good prediction of whether these repairs will heal. Does smoking affect the outcome? Well, yes, it does. And when you look here, if you look at 95 smokers current and then a history of 40 packs per day versus 129 matched non-smokers, the UCLA scores were significantly different for the two groups, showing that non-smokers were far more likely to heal and have a good to excellent result. Does osteoporosis affect outcome? Medicare is requiring patients uh, to get a uh, DEXA scan within two years of each other. And so in many of these patients, we have this information. There's a failure rate of about 23% in those patients that are osteoporotic. So it's important when you look at the odds ratio of cuff failure in patients with osteoporosis versus normal, it's 1.56 versus 0.22. So if you know that you have a patient that is osteoporotic, maybe a rotator cuff repair is not the best option for them. Does diabetes make a difference? So in 2,400 plus patients at ease of capsulitis, diabetics were about 16% versus non-diabetics about four. Retair, 26% versus 15%. And any complication at all, 35% in diabetics, where it was about 23% in non-diabetics. So again, understand if the patient is diabetic, Try to figure out if the A1C um, is uh, too high, as we've seen with total joints. But increasing A1C was not found to be associated with higher risk of frozen shoulder re-tear or reoperation. But it can, however, give us a good idea of how well the diabetes is under control. Does doxycycline affect outcome? Uh, Ashish Beatty looked at this, looked at the RAT model of repairs of supraspinatus and found that doxy-mediated inhibition of MMPs reduce the excessive degradation or remodeling of healing, uh, healing tendons after rotator cuff repair. So what it found is it, it protected those patients that were trying to heal and avoided having some of those MMPs affect that repair. And the other uh, benefit was that it is a broad spectrum antimicrobial activity uh, that has gram negative and gram positive, including C acnes. So you have the benefit of it protecting against one of the bacteria we are concerned about, as well as the fact that it helps healing. So for these patients, you can start these right after surgery and it's a two week dose. So when we look at vitamin D, does that make a difference? Well, one of the things we saw at this rat model here is that when using, utilizing CT, it showed that biomechanical testing had significant decrease in load to failure in experimental group compared to the control group. So at four weeks, there was no difference in load to failure, but the histology did show that bone formation of less collagen fiber organization was seen in the vitamin D deficient group. So again, winter in the North with patients with vitamin D deficiency may not be the best time to fix some of these rotator cuffs. How about lipid status? Here, hyperlipidemia in patients without a statin was higher uh, for rates of revision. Revision rates increase in patients with moderate and high level LDLs. So a patient with hyperlipidemia may also have increased issues with healing a rotator cuff. Well, here we can look at comorbidities. Look at Larry Galata's group. This was uh, published last year. Smoking versus diabetes, hyperlipidemia, vitamin D deficiency, osteoporosis, looked at about 41,000 plus patients. Increasing age in male sex had an increased odds ratio uh, for revision rotator cuff repair. Looking at all these things combined, found a revision rate of almost uh, 9%. Smoking was the most significantly uh, predicted neat reason for revision. Obesity was another, hyperlipidemia, vitamin D deficiency, and then diabetes was actually found to be protective against some revision surgeries, likely because the patient got stiff. So, over the last few years, biologics have become uh, very important. Uh, this uh, critical analysis review was done in JBJS in 2018. So what they looked at is PRP and found PRP to actually have a recommendation that can help with good level one studies. Bone marrow aspirate concentrate in a single row uh, to decrease rote retears, not necessarily uh, gonna help more of a neutral uh, because of the paucity of clinical data, stem cell augmentation cannot be universally or definitively recommended in all cases. Here again, this was a no. 
Uh, acellular dermal matrix was used to augment rotator cuff repair and shown to decrease rotator cuff rates and improve clinical outcomes compared with repair alone, neutral. And then the xenograft augmentation was shown to have no effect or re-tear, and this was also neutral. So I think it's really important because industry will tell us that everything that they sell is very helpful, but it not, isn't necessarily proven out in the data thus far. Again, with this PRP group, uh, uh, this is a foreign level one study looking at this 64 patients, um, looking at the PG, PRGF and at, given at the end of the scope, uh, injected into the tendon and then spread over the top. No significant difference in scores, no differences at one year. And the MR arthrogram showed 40% heal, 30% partially healed, and 30% did not heal. So there's no difference in those receiving PRP versus the control groups. This, however, in a randomized single blind a parallel group trial was done. And again, another foreign uh, paper out of Korea, 48 patients PRP group and three PRP gels. And what they found was that the PRP group uh, had a retail rate of about 20%. Conventional group had about 55%. So uh, much better with the PRP group. And they had an increase in cross-sectional area of the supraspinatus. There's no difference in clinical outcomes, uh, structural outcomes, and uh, might suggest that the improved clinical outcomes in a uh, longer term follow-up if, if this was uh, seen at longer uh, time periods, more than nine months. So what if we debride and partially repair? So when we do a partial repair, this is uh, kind of older data, but still being done. And these articles from 2010 and 2012 show high retail rates, uh, upwards of 42 to even 52% with a partial repair. Uh, so this may not be our best option. How about repair with some sort of extracellular matrix, augmentation, scaffold, or even biologics? Regenitin has become popular. This is a Smith & Nephew product. It's a reconstituted bovine collagen, 90% porous, high uh, purity, but very low structural strength. So it's not going to afford you any additional strength to the repair. It is bioabsorbable, and it is load sharing, not load bearing. In this article by uh, Buddy Savoy and Mike O'Brien, two to three tendon large tears showed a 96% healing rate at two years. This is far different than the Yamaguchi papers that showed 50% tears at two years. So again, no adverse reaction seen and the mean ASES scores increase. So this might be a good way to help with the augmentation of a large repair and then placing this uh, implant over it. Rhodium bioabsorbable wick from Atrion. This is another uh, new product. This actually goes under the rotator cuff and this is a wicking uh, type um, implant. And what this does is if you do marrow vents and you try to get some of that biology from the patient, this holds it there and holds that wick underneath the repair, allowing these nanofibers to capture the growth factors and allowing for better healing uh, for the rotator cuff. Here at 12 weeks, you can see the tendon bone insertion. You see some indirect or fibrous type insertion uh, fibers. There's no real attempt to reestablish uh, direct fibrocartilaginous synthesis, but this is what we, we want to start seeing uh, when we look at the rhodium patch here on the right versus uh, control. You see a little bit thicker uh, site of the anthesis. You see that there's uh, native direct fibrocartilaginous insertion. You see increased Sharpies fibers. So by holding some of those uh, growth factors in position, it allows for the healing of the rotator cuff repair as compared to control. Biores Biobrace implant, this is new. It is not yet FDA approved, but shortly, uh, hopefully later this year, it should be. But what's nice about this, it's a collagen PLLA biocomposite soft tissue scaffold composed of type one bovine collagen and resorbable PLLA microfilaments. What this is gonna do is as we place this on the rotator cuff, it's gonna increase the cross-sectional area and therefore uh, allow for better healing. The goal is with this highly porous scaffold is to allow for rapid influx of cells and it holds it in place, uh, essentially getting stuck uh, in this position to allow for the healing. So the biobrace allows for more of these cells to stay where they need to stay in order to help with the healing. And the implant can hold 300% of its own weight. So it's gonna be able to hold a lot of the, uh, the factors that we need. So at six weeks, the bioinductive scaffold has the fibroblasts and dense regularly oriented connective tissue. By 12 weeks, it starts to mature and remodel and over time resorbs, allowing for that rotator cuff to uh, heal. And this was presented by Walsh at ORS earlier this year. 
Again, with the BioRes BioBrace, you can see how it lays directly over the rotator cuff. It can be positioned appropriately, just run your sutures through it, and it, uh, the scaffold will hold everything uh, in place, allowing that rotator cuff to heal and incorporate into this uh, fiber. So when you look at these synthetics for biologics, you look at allograft tissue, you wanna increase your mechanical reinforcement and improve your healing. So you can see, depending on the types of uh, products you're using, where they fit, but orthobiologics may increase healing, but don't necessarily increase your mechanical reinforcement. Allografts are right there in the middle. Uh, something like this BioRes 3D composite, you can see kind of has both mechanical uh, reinforcement and healing uh, improvement. What about if we use acellular dermis for repair? Alan Barber's group with Marco Bay and uh, Another, and the rest of the group, two tendon rotator cuff tears, three centimeters, 42 patients. Uh, and what they saw is with the two groups, the group with uh, ACL human um, dermis showed 85% healing versus the group two was about 40% and better rate, uh, scores uh, slightly, but not significant. Uh, constant scores, however, uh, were significant for the augment group. Uh, UCLA score is no significant difference, but it did show that maybe augmentation allows for uh, better healing uh, for these larger tears. What about superior capsule reconstruction that's been popularized over the last few years? Here in this video, you can see the superior capsule. You can see that articular margin like we talked about earlier. So this part here that is being pulled is the actual tendon and the superior capsule uh, is seen right there on the inferior portion, which you can see lines up perfectly with that articular margin and we're grabbing it here. So I think it's important to really understand where that is and so you don't over tension. But what the superior capsular does is it is a passive constraint to the glenohumeral joint to prevent the superior migration of the humeral head. It is a dynamic stabilizer of the joint and resists um, superior migration of the humeral head with deltoid contraction. So what is this role? Well, Hamada looked at this very closely, uh, excuse me, Mahata uh, looked at this very closely and found that the superior capsule is about four to nine millimeters thick covered about 30 to 60% of the greater tuberosity. And without a superior capsule, humeral transition increased in all planes. Restoring the SCR therefore was thought that if you could do that, you could reverse the superior translation and decrease the subacromial contact pressures. So the indications for doing a superior capsule reconstruction are that the Hamada grade one and two, so very little to no arthritis, uh, intolerable pain and an unacceptable dysfunction with an irreparable rotator cuff tear. You need to, however, have an intact or repairable subscapularis. Contraindications are rotator cuff tears with moderate to severe rotator cuff arthropathy. So, excuse me, uh, hamata grade uh, greater than or equal to three and glenohumeral arthritis and an irreparable superior, excuse me, an irreparable subscapularis. So how it works is it's positioned between the glenoid and the uh, tuberosity. And what it does, it pushes down on that humeral head, therefore allowing for this fulcrum to allow as that deltoid fires to push that down and allow that, uh, that humerus to move forward. So what can be seen here is with these different changes, once you restore uh, a, a superior capsule, you can see that the translation decreases significantly and therefore by doing that uh, keeps that head down allowing for forward flexion. The contact pressures as well will decrease if you can keep it from rubbing up against the acromion. What's very important, however, is if you just do an SCR, the superior migration will not be changed. But if you do a superior reconstruction and do it and attach it to the infraspinatus, essentially you make a barrier for that humeral head, therefore it won't go up and you'll reverse your superior migration. If you, if you tie it to the front to the subscapularis, it really doesn't make any additional effect. But the key to this procedure is to have a good positioned uh, SCR, but tie it into the infraspinatus into the native tendon. Now, if you're missing an infraspinatus, this is a problem. It can still be done, but your outcomes aren't going to be nearly as good. And we'll talk about that more as we talk about uh, the tendon transfers shortly. So when you look at the biomechanical effects, uh, you can see that the thickness does matter of these uh, graphs. Less than four millimeter graphs reduced the subacromial contact pressure, but it did not really fix the superior migration and whereas the eight millimeter graft used by uh, Mahada's group had a uh, greater in decrease um, in contact pressure and also prevented uh, the superior migration. 
what he did is he took a large piece here of um, tensor fascia lata and then doubled it on itself, making it about eight millimeters. The clinical outcome data of the two graphs uh, was not necessarily generalized. So it's important to understand that we're, when you're talking about a three millimeter or four millimeter uh, dermal allograph versus Mahata's work, they can't really be compared. So in Mahata's work from 2013, this is a level four study, 23 patients. His graft was about six to eight millimeters thick, 83% healed. He increases active forward flexion and external rotation and also increased the acromial humeral distance and the ASES scores increased significantly. Hirohara in 2017 had only eight patients in the study using three millimeter acellular dermal graft. And here the best scores did come down he did have slight increase in his range of motion and increase in the acromial humeral distance uh, and the ASES scores came down. One patient was revised uh, to a uh, reverse in this particular study, but this study uh, is kind of weak based on how many patients are in it. Mahata's group, uh, 2018, 100 patients using a, a fascia autograph, six to eight millimeters, complication rate of about 16%, five graft tears. But again, you see significant increase in range of motion and uh, mean Japanese orthopedic association score of 53 to 91. So these patients did get better. And you can see over on the right in this uh, chart that these were uh, salt of the earth type people, farmers, carpenters, construction workers. So these were workers that were able to return to their uh, normal jobs. Here uh, in Denard's group, 2018, level four study, 59 patients. This was an acellular dermal all allograph, three millimeters. Uh, VAS scores came down, ASES scores went up. But what was interesting, the acromial humeral index didn't change very much, 45 patients only. And these were in the healed group. And what he found is actually many of those that failed, failed off the humeral side. In uh, those that he had success, however, he had about 67.8%. So is 67.8% good enough to continue to do this type of procedure? What he did find in his 11 failures, seven failures were on the humeral side, one inner substance and one glenoid, but 100% success rate in those that healed. So what is the issue? So is it the graft doesn't heal? Is it that we didn't prepare the tuberosity? Is it the implants we use? So the takeaway, patients with Hamada one and two, best candidates, higher subscapular atrophy had poor prognosis. Pennington's group, acellular uh, dermal all al al graft, and again, VAS scores, ASCS scores came down, um, AHI increased, which is what we would want. Superior capsule distance uh, also was good. And 90% of these patients were satisfied. And the takeaway here is he's, he explained the importance of pulling down on the arm. So if you're using some type of arm holder, abduct the arm, pull down the arm, slight internal rotation, and therefore the head is depressed by the time you're fixating your lateral side of the graft. Mahada, 2019 level four study using his autograph tensor fascia lata, uh, at five years, healed SCR restored shoulder function and resulted in higher rates of return to sport and work at patients with graft failure and severe atrophy went on to uh, cuff tear arthropathy. So the takeaway here, Mahata's group, posterior side to side sutures with the infraspinatus uh, gave you posterior continuity, and this is what restored stability of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, Mahata, again, 15 to 45 degrees of shoulder abduction and 20 degrees of internal rotation with an eight millimeter thick uh, fascia lata graft restored shoulder stability better than a four millimeter thick uh, fascia lata. Again, from Mahata. Uh, decrease the subacromial, uh, excuse me, acromioplasty decrease the subacromial contact area, raising that ceiling uh, above the uh, SCR. And then finally here, uh, three millimeter thick grafts will elongate and by elongation will lose the ability to depress that humeral head and therefore not uh, restore the superior glenohumeral stability that we want. So SCR versus partial infraspinatus repairs. This was a paper uh, that recently came out. And in this particular paper, 21 SCR patients uh, versus a uh, partial repair group, uh, they compared the sex, age, and tear configuration, as well as the Gutelier grades, minimum of two-year follow-up, uh, mean age of both groups of about 62%, looking at constant scores, uh, age and sex, uh, DASH scores, work scores, and reoperation rates. Uh, what they found uh, was 4.8 in the SCR group versus about 15% in the partial repair group. Both SCR and PR 
uh, resulted in significant improvements in patient reported outcomes at two years with no significant differences between the two. So the takeaway of this is if you can fix anything, it's probably just as good um, versus trying to go through sometimes a clumsy procedure, it can be said, uh, versus a repair. SCR technical tips uh, position, you wanna fix that SCR at about 45 degrees of abduction, 20 degrees of internal rotation. A graft thickness is uh, the bigger, the better. Eight millimeters is better than four. Uh, four millimeter plus decreases the subacromial contact pressure, but grafts of that about three or less will elongate leading to thinning of the graft and therefore loss of the depressive effect of the SCR. Conclusions overall, as of 2020 and now 2021, uh, the younger, more active um, with a subscap that's intact or repairable, absence of osteoarthritis, absence of acetabularization, uh, good external rotation, strength of at least three to four or five, and that are gonna be compliant. It's technically challenging. The thicker the dermal graft, the better. Uh, primary repair is our first goal with some plus or minus some augmentation as previously discussed and fix what you can. And sometimes you can fix something and still do the SCR. What about tendon transfers, lower trapezius versus a uh, latissimus dorsi? So when looking at this, let's first understand what we're talking about. The arthroscopic assistant lower trapezius tendon transfer. This is gonna be for symptomatic irreparable cuffs, and this is gonna be more for anterior superior and even posterior superior. So this is gonna be more supraspinatus, infraspinatus uh, tears. You need to have a good, or a, at least a repairable subscapularis. Um, these patients tend to have an external rotation lag sign and an intact teres minor. So here you can see as we take it off the scapular spine, just peel it right off of there. It is in line with the infraspinatus. So it's an excellent way to do a tendon transfer where you're going to attach it to the tuberosity by augmentation. And we'll go through that in a second. And what that will do is he'll have the same pull as the infraspinatus. So here you can see that once the uh, uh, lower trapezius is found. We can attach it to an allograft of Achilles tendon. Most often in Europe, uh, they're doing a semitendinosus autograft, but you need to lengthen that tendon in order to get it to the tuberosity. So again, posterior superior rotator cuff tears, these are not re all repairable. And if they're reparable and you have massive tears, uh, two plus tendons, fatty atrophy, gutalia three and four, substantial retraction of the, to the glenoid and proximal humeral migration, this is an excellent indication for a transfer. The trapezius, its origin, um, the middle third of the nuchal line, ligament of nuche, uh, the spinous process, uh, and the supraspinous ligament uh, to T12. The insertion is on the upper fibers to the lateral third of the clavicle, the lower to medial acromion and the superior lip of the spine of the scapula to the deltoid tubercle. It laterally rotates, elevates and retracts the scapula. If a uh, scapula is fixed, it extends and laterally flexes the neck. Its innervation is the spinal accessory nerve, which is roughly two centimeters medial to the medial scapular border. The principles of tendon transfers, the transferred tendon uh, and recipient muscles should have a similar excursion and tension. The transferred muscle must be expandable. The transferred and recipient tendon should have a similar line of pull as we discussed. And the transferred muscle should be designed to replace only one function of the re recipient's muscle. So why is a lower trapezius a good option? Well, it's fairly simple. It's arthroscopically assisted, it has better restoration of shoulder biomechanics. The line of pull of the lower trap is very similar to that of the infraspinatus. The ease of post-operative training uh, for the transfer, as it contracts, the shoulder will externally rotate. If you bring it even more anterior, you will forward flex. Partial subscapularis tear is not a contraindication. What about a latissimus dorsi? 25 patients in this study looking at this follow-up of 35.7 months, uh, range 12 to 60, revision in primary patients with mean increase and in constant uh, scores, 29 to about 34.5 respectively, osteoarthritis progression in about a third, good clinical outcomes at a midterm follow-up. Uh, and you can see here in active men, 60 years of age or younger, patients with low preoperative elevation of less than 80%, this uh, this was helpful, especially if they had a repairable or intact subscap. So when looking at this with Tane Lee's group, um, good results reported with flat transfer, 
not reproducible to all surgeon. It is an out of phase transfer. It starts as an internal rotator and becomes an external rotator. It is definitely more difficult. And if you have morbidity to the pedicle, uh, it's a big problem. Biomechanical testing in comparison, uh, it, it's not nearly as simple as the way the lower trap works. And the lower trap is superior to restoring native glenohumeral kinematics and joint reaction forces. Uh, Bissam El Hassan uh, popularized this uh, more recently, looking at paralytic shoulders uh, from trauma to obstetrics, found significant improvement of external rotation uh, and even uh, abduction and flexion. It's easy to find anatomically distinct insertion, uh, insertion on that scapular spine. The middle trapezius a little bit broader, uh, the lower trapezius reliably identified, and then you just do a simple muscle split. Uh, to get there, the infraspinatus is usually not there because of the, that's the main reason why you're there taking the lower trapezius. And again, it's stated above the spinal accessory nerve is two centimeters medial to that medial scapular border. The outcomes, uh, 33 patients with an average of uh, 53 uh, years of age, uh, average follow-up about 47 months, and you can see her flexion and abduction and, uh, and external rotation much better. This is one of my patients at rough edit the three-month visit. Uh, the right side is the lower trapezius transfer, so he's very happy here. This was an irreparable supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Outcome of a lower trapezius transfer to reconstruct a massive irreparable posterior superior rotator cuff. Again, uh, patients with uh, greater than 60 degrees of preoperative flexion, more significant gains in range of motion, especially at ER, complications, four seromas, uh, observation only, one infection required uh, shoulder fusion and a conclusion. Uh, lower trapezius transfer may uh, lead to good outcomes in most patients. So this is, this is my personal algorithm. So if I have a repairable tear uh, with poor tissue or smoker or diabetic or thyroid issues or a possible revision, I'll do a cuff tear with some type of dermal allograft or even xenograft or synthetic, depending on uh, the particular patient. If I have an irreparable supraspinatus, an intact or repairable infraspinatus, minimal to no glenohumeral arthritis with an intact or repairable subscapularis, an SCR with dermal allograft is done. And finally, if there is uh, irreparable supraspinatus and infraspinatus with an external rotation lag sign, no to minimal glenohumeral arthritis with an intact or repairable subscapularis, I will go with the lower trapezius uh, transfer with Achilles allograft. Thank you.